today I'm joined by Tom Waterhouse. Tom, thank you very much for joining me. Before we get into this episode, make sure you follow us on Twitter, at BettingPod, and check out the website, businessofbetting.com. Guest suggestions are much appreciated. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair Proprietary Limited. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Business of Betting podcast. Today, I'm joined by Tom Waterhouse. Tom, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, Jake. Good to be here. So, Tom, did you always enjoy racing and, and wagering growing up? No, as a kid, actually, um, I didn't like it at all. My my sister and I used to complain all the time because my parents, we felt, uh, always talked about horses. And we just went, this, this is the most boring topic. Can we talk about something else besides horse racing? So, uh and I worked with my mum from the age of twelve every holidays and every Sunday at the at the stables, and I, and I thought it was, um, yeah, I thought it was torture actually. Um, yeah, no, I, I didn't like it at all as a kid. So something must have changed then. Was there was there a sort of a tipping point in your teenage years or in your early twenties where you thought, you know, I'll give it a go and see what you know Robbie was doing or Bill? And obviously your your mum's a well known horse trainer and. Uh, very famous in the Australian market. So, what was the time where you thought, okay, I'll um, I'll give it a go? Yeah, well, look, I was I was at uh, university and and thinking I was going to go into some sort of commerce or finance um, type role. And um, my dad, halfway through my first year, said, "Look, do you want to come out and uh, help me at the track one day?" And and I went out there and literally within sort of five minutes of being there, I, I went, "This is the best." And there was just so much um, activity money flying around, big bets, action. And, and I basically, I just said to him, look, if, if you ever need me again, I'll, I'll be here whenever you need me and, and changed all my shoots around and basically went to as many race meetings as I could as I went through uni and, and I was I was hooked. And, and then it was funny because my, my mum would complain that my dad and I would never shut up about racing and, and she'd say, can you talk about something else? So it was, yeah, I, from that moment on, it, there was basically nothing else. I just loved loved horse racing and loved betting. So you must have picked up a lot in that household, but those first few weeks and months of the track, were you blown away by what was going on? Did you have a certain expectation going in? Well, it's, my dad always said, look, when you get to the, to the racetrack, because he hadn't been at the racetrack for, uh, well, I was a bookie for 18 years, something like that. He said, look, just uh, make sure, be careful of pickpockets. There's lots of pickpockets around the track. Keep, keep your hands by your sides. Keep that bag close. I've never to this day ever seen or heard about a pickpocket at the races. So things had um, things had changed a, a bit. But no, I was I was just wet behind the ears, didn't know anything. But, but I just uh, tried to absorb as much as possible and spoke to my dad about it when we weren't at the racetrack every day and going out in the car, just kept asking him questions and and just watching and learning and and then work with my grandfather. It was uh, it was just yeah, it was fantastic. So what responsibilities were you taking on at that stage? Were you, you know, riding on tickets? What were you uh, entrusted with on the early few few years? I went, I've started working out on the bag um, and then on the computer and a few country race meetings where you had to still write tickets. I had to write the tickets um, and uh, working then on the ground. And, and look, my dad had all through my childhood, my dad basically um, would just – it put unlimited trust in me and, and basically belief. And so I still sort of six weeks in at being at the track, he had to go away and he said, look, uh, you run my stand. And I definitely didn't have the skills to, to do that. I, I didn't have the knowledge, but he basically he gave me some sort of basic set of rules and said, look, follow this and, and you'll be okay. And, and always, both my parents always used to throw my sister and myself in at the deep end and, and believe that we'd sort it out and, and find a way to do it. And, and, that gave me, uh, yeah, a lot of. Luckily, I had a not through any real skill, but luckily, I had a few winning days running your stand for me, and it just gave me more and more confidence. And and when things are going well, you want to keep doing them and and learn more. And and so, basically, for the next few years, working with my dad and and then with my grandfather, I did ev- basically every role you possibly could, and and um and loved them all. Just it was it was just so much fun. And then you went out on your own, and you got your own license. 
Yeah, so look, I got when I was still at uni, I got a license out of the out of the dogs and and the provincial provincial race meetings, and used to go to the dogs every Saturday night. And Dad said, "Look, this is a great place for you to go and cut your teeth. You you won't lose much, but you'll you'll learn a lot." So I did all the prices for the dogs and and set the market there. And there was only four or five bookies, and and really just didn't really know much what I was doing, but just learning and. Uh, and there's some pretty tough, tough punters out there, and they were only really professionals, and it was just a great experience. And so worked, um, and then my grandfather obviously came back to the racetrack at the age of 80, and and I worked with him for the next five or six years. Um, we worked up from being the or the worst stand at the at the track um, to being the yeah the biggest bookies at, at the racetrack. So it was just a, a great journey and a great time to spend with my grandfather. We he, he was so much fun as a kid growing up with him that he'd feed me chocolates and ice cream for, for breakfast and, and used to run around trying to shoot pigeons together and, and just doing so much fun stuff. And then at the racetrack, he was just completely different and used to tear my head off every day and absolutely yell abuse at me on the way home every afternoon in the car. And I, I thought, oh yeah, has no idea what he's talking about. And he thought I was a young idiot. We had this sort of absolute firecracker arguments for the first three years working together and and then I realized after after a while he's actually right about nearly everything he said and we formed a great partnership working together so why was the dog such a a good training ground for someone in the early years of their bookmaking career you, you couldn't lose that much in that it was, there weren't there weren't that many people there the betting wasn't huge turnover wasn't big but to actually go and try and set set a market and do the form and and to Basically, it, it was just a sort of a, a smaller environment of the, the racetrack that was close by, and um, yeah, just uh, I found it great, Re- really good, and and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was just a lot of fun, a lot, a lot of fun. The dogs. So, what were the most difficult aspects for you in those sort of early three, five years, where you learn a lot and you picked up a lot of things from family members and others at the track? I think probably the um, the toughest things was was managing the relationship with with my grandfather. In that, uh, my grandfather was the biggest bookie in, in the world, and he wanted to bet really big. And my uh, my dad said to my grandfather, "Look, Tom has no idea what he's doing. He's young. He's only just come back to come come to the track, and you have to teach him the art of bookmaking. You're in charge." And said to me, "Look, um, your grandfather's in his 80s." He uh, hasn't been a bookie for 18 years. Look, he he wants to bet big, but the game's changed. You're in charge, and uh, so we both thought we were completely in charge, and and uh, and had these. I didn't want to lose, and and he wanted to bet huge, and um, so we had this sort of dynamic that was um, really interesting, and and uh, managing a gra- grandfather you love and admire and respect, but uh, trying to manage that relationship, and and. Yeah, we it's it's a fine line between betting very big and and losing a lot to to managing your risks and and then growing and and I learned a, I learned so much from my grand I learned so much from both my dad and my grandfather but he uh, he definitely molded me into to being a big bookie um, my grandfather and and uh, we had some uh, so I, I used to always control the computer and and um, we go in together and make sure that we were very organised and then he said one day. Look, uh, Tom, I have to go in uh, to take a take a piss. So I'll meet you in there, um, and I can't say to him, "No, wait for me." Of course, he's eighty something years old. Go and I'll meet you in at the racetrack. And he goes in there, and there's no boards up, no bookies betting on anything. But there's a race at the Gold Coast, and he decides to go even money the favourite at the Gold Coast when it was a dollar twenty on the call, and starts yelling out to run even money the favourite at the Gold Coast, and starts taking all of these bets from people. Um, because they obviously can see it's a dollar twenty, and he's gone two dollars, and um, I come charging. And I'm like, "What the hell are you doing? We haven't got any form for the Gold Coast. We don't bet on the Gold Coast. W- what are you doing?" And he said, "Look, Tom, don't even worry about it. If if it gets beaten, we'll we'll win a hundred thousand before the races start, and uh, uh, and if it wins, well, look, everyone will be talking about how they miss Bill Waterhouse betting even money the dollar twenty chance." We'll get so much free publicity out of it, and <laughs> and I thought he was insane. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I dealing with here? But he uh, he thinks big. He's a big. He thinks big picture, and he's uh, and he t- he taught me that. Um, and he and he was actually 
if you'd asked me, would, was he right at the time, I would have sworn black and blue that he wasn't, but he actually was right about everything. He was, uh, it was, it was amazing, amazing time together. So would you often clash about sort of individual details or was it more the bigger ideas and the fundamentals of, of bookmaking and wagering? There's there's so many different ways to win at bookmaking. Like I, I look at my, my dad and he's a, a form genius and he spends so much time in the detail of every single runner on that meeting and, and he he just consistently wins all the time. And and my grandfather doesn't look at the individual for me, looks plays the man and, and is more of a, a gambler type and both can be very successful. You look at all the bookies on the on the rails in Sydney, that they, they have different ways that they win at, at bookmaking. And so I'd learned one particular way from, from my dad and I assumed that was the only way. And so I'd, I'd be to my grandfather, well, that's not how you do it because I'd, I'd spent time with my dad. But so we had, but he was very good in that he didn't argue. We, we never really argued out in front of people in, in on the stand, but going back in the car for someone in his eighties, he could remember every single bet, every detail, new to the dollar, how he went, without having access to the computer and would uh, basically point out every bit through the day, well, why would you have done that? That's ridiculous. How could you have done this? You're going to lose all your money doing that and, and critique every little bit. And uh, and I just cop it in the car, but it was great. Uh, it was just a really fun time. It sounds like it was it was really was a partnership rather than that sort of boss-employee mentality, which which helped you develop, I guess, your own ideas. Well, he, we needed each other in that I was, I was young and, and inexperienced and the world had changed in that if, if we were still writing tickets, he'd probably be the best ticket writer out of the racetrack, but uh, there were computers and so I operated a computer and how to set things up and, and had, had, had the form and, and all of this sort of stuff. And, and, and he had the knowledge of, of being a bookie for the last 40, 50 years. So sort of looking back, how was he able to sort of stand the test of time and, and across decades and across sort of different areas, eras of, of betting and racing, how was he able to sort of continue to evolve? If you sort of look back from a bird's eye view and, and pick apart a couple of the major things that Bill had, what would stand out to you? Well, he, he's uh, amazing with, with and, and lesson of teaching about cash flow. So, um, he's very lean. Like he, we could win or lose a million or, or more dollars in a, in a day and uh, he'd complain about that we were taking the tunnel back from Randwick. What the hell are you doing paying the tunnel <laughs> on the way back? Ultra lean. Like, and runs his life ultra lean. So managing cash flow and, and sees dollar off the race course is very different to a dollar on the race course. And, um, and he... Basically, well, he thinks big picture. How are you going to create a way for people to know you're betting big, to let them on, play the man? Um, you'll you'll wear the punter down in in the end. Um, you, he was basically limit your losses, unlimit your wins. So if someone's behind. Well, why keep the first day we had a big punter betting with us, and he he lost um, 1.2 million dollars in his first day first day betting and and i i was first big punter i'd ever had so i thought gosh what an amazing day we've won so much money and but i bet back six hundred thousand at trying to limit the losses because they obviously a big punter can win a lot off you and i ended up having to we had to pay out six hundred thousand dollars on on the monday or tuesday for settling to the other bookmakers and that punter didn't pay for a year and a half so that kind of lesson without my grandfather would have sent sent me out of business you know it's it's but constantly reinforcing, well, why are you doing that? You might think that's a risk, but in the scheme of things, well, you're actually cash flow wise, it's not a risk at all. And and really, he was very good in cash flow and, and eye for detail. Like, as I mentioned, he could remember every single thing that was happening, never left the stand. Like, for an 80 year old person to never go, <laughs> never leave the stand all day long, he'd just sit there and watch like a hawk over everything. And, and he was tough. He was really tough. Like, say yeah look you just need to if people aren't doing the right the right thing if they're not up to the standard you need you just have to get rid of them move them on straight away uh, the other the other people in the business deserve that you um that you get rid of people that are, are not up to the standard and you keep that high standard and um yeah it was 
he was great, great mentor. Both my my dad and my grandfather were unbelievable, unbelievable, and are unbelievable mentors. I still, my grandfather's still alive and well at 96, and uh, has uh, unlimited knowledge. And and my dad obviously still at the races every week. So when you went out on your own, what was your sort of mission statement? And based on what I've lo- a lot of what you've already said, I can probably sort of think about a few things that might come to mind. But as you, as you think about it, your style and, and mission statement, did you boil it down to one or two ideas or how did you think about it? Oh, so look, um, the, I would have stayed working by, side by side with my grandfather forever. It's just that my, um, my, uh, the, I had a license in Melbourne and the, and the laws changed in New South Wales in 2008. And so I went down for a short-term stay to Melbourne and, um, Look, there were a few things advantages being Melbourne. Obviously, there was lower tax because race fields hadn't come in in the same way as in New South Wales. Um, you could have access to the internet, so you had access to Betfair um, in 2008, which you didn't as a Sydney on-course bookmaker, and you could offer your clients best tote. And so you had a few different things that you could have in Melbourne, and, and suddenly I had a, a, something unique to the Sydney clients that I could offer them this best tote product. I, I knew where the market was happening off course, I knew the Sydney bookies if I needed to bet back with them, and and um, it created an environment that was was really really good uh, for for a period of time, and and also had some some really big clients betting with us. So we were holding five six million dollars a day, um, ma- mainly telephone clients, and sort of twenty million dollars or more over the um, the carnival in in the four days of the spring carnival in two thousand and eight, and had these new things that I didn't have six months before in, in Sydney. So it, it was, it was, it was terrific. Um, but then like all things within a year, um, the business dramatically changed. Obviously the internet bookies um, suddenly could advertise in 2008. You had the iPhone that came out just a sort of a year before you had 3G um, internet connection. And, and suddenly uh, there was the money that was on course and around betting with the telephone bookmakers suddenly went to the internet and, so from 2000 and, 2008 Derby Day, I got 500,000 cash out of the favourite of the Derby. And 2009 Derby Day, I was two rolls over the favourite in 2009 Derby, and I only got 5,000 cash out of it. And I went, well, look, this is this is no good. It's wow. completely changed in one year. And so I became a, got an office in Mooney Valley and became a telephone bookmaker only, and still holding large numbers on the telephone, but the on-course had completely it completely changed within a one year period. And, um, and that's, you've seen that decline continue. I just, um, I guess with all these businesses, with, whether it's a, an on-course bookie or telephone bookie or internet, uh, or even now with the internet businesses, the, the environment changes. And it's not necessarily the way you run your business, but it's, it's the external environment. Where the, at the time, you probably go, well, I know that money's leaving the track, but you don't think, well, look, the iPhone's been released or there's better internet connection or the advertising, you probably don't put all the little bits, and it's probably 10 other reasons as well, but you don't put all the reasons together. You just, you can feel things are changed and, and you've got to, you've got to move quickly. And, um, and that's what, that's what we did. So take me back to 08 for a minute. You just mentioned 20 million you held over the, the Melbourne carnival. What sort of emotions were going through over those sort of, that sort of week from Derby day to, to Emirates, as a, I'm guessing, a young man, you're probably still in your 20s at that stage. Well, look, you you, you work your way up to it. I, I know I was just so distraught and stressed. Um, uh, John Singleton had 10,000 on Belle de Jour with us um, back years before, and and I never lost 100,000. Win or lose five or ten thousand dollars in a day was a huge loss, and we lost 100,000 dollars on this on this race. And I was just completely distraught. My grandfather said, "Look." If you learn how to lose $100,000, you'll know how to win $100,000. Don't worry. Just absorb it. You're, and so by the time 2008 comes around and turning over $20 million over those four days, and we're betting in, in telephone numbers, it was, it was, it's not like it suddenly hits you. It's it just part and parcel of, of betting big and, and lots of clients. And, and, yeah, obviously you have the, the, the stress of, having a losing day but not really it's just part and parcel of 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 betting that way i know derby day i was, I was down in melbourne and the, down on the on the rails there and my grandfather i think 
besides Concaps Taras and myself were the, was the last Sydney bookie to work on the rails in, in 1968 in Melbourne. And he came down for Derby Day to, to watch this day. And I, and I lost $2 million on the, on the day. Um, and he, he was just beaming, just so proud that his grandson is down there betting and, and betting big. And you sort of take it in your stride in, in that as long as you're following the rules and the business plan and the way you're doing it and you're managing the clients in the right way and you're making sure that you're laying them at the right price and you're managing your risk at the top price and you can't get down because that's part of, of betting big. You have massive swings. So was there ever fear in an in individual race or, or meeting or was it, it sounds like a lot of it would have been pretty fun. How did you think about it at the time or I guess looking back? I think the only time I remember getting really a, a bit nervous was, um, so Derby Day 2008, we lost two million dollars on the on the day, and had some really big clients betting with me at the time. And I invited a stack of them to come to the call of the card on the Monday. And I've never worked at the call of the card, and at, at, to this point, so this is the first call of the card I worked at. And they started betting big there and backing things to win a million, two million dollars, and 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 so I was. You normally have a race, and you can know how you you're going to go within 20 minutes or 40 minutes of when they're fed where the calls and cards you you've got to wait till the next day and so i'm stuck going through my head i go well gosh i've just lost two million dollars on the saturday i i could be down four million or five million come come tomorrow and that was probably a sleepless night but besides that i can't think of um i can't think of it you just it's just part and parcel of it i it's and also as i said you're working your way up you know it's a it's uh, the biggest shock is when you have such a large loss like that $100,000 loss I mentioned two years before when you're not betting that big. But if you're betting big consistently day in, day out, then they sound like big losses because I, I'm, I'm giving you one instance rather than what a... Uh, like the Wednesday of after Melbourne Cup probably held a few million dollars on the Wednesday when it's a... I forget what meetings on the Wednesday, but like a Geelong or something like that, you know. So it's not, it it doesn't. It feels weird that I wouldn't have those emotions when I mentioned to you just as a as a number or a day. But you work your work, your way up to that. You condition yourself. So how did your business plan change when you transitioned to online? So that again was a, a, a longer period of time in that. So we moved into the office in two thousand and nine, um, and moved into the office in 2009. We had a, an internet offering uh, at late 2009. So we sort of had a, a year sort of dry run um, of a year, a year dry run of, uh, of taking bets on the, uh, on the internet. And then we launched with sport and racing, a soft launch again, no, no real advertising in 2010. And that was like, we went from um, three people in the office uh, Sam Swanell, who who was a, a key figure at Tote Tasmania, came on board, and we we got a, a few young, very talented guys in. But there was only two or three of us in in the office um, to to begin with, and then uh, it sort of uh, it, it grows in time. We grew to well within sort of three years, a couple of well over a hundred people, um, and. Um, yeah, it was, it was just we're moving in the office. Actually, the, so Sam came in and we had two guys working with us and we caught them stealing basically on our first day. And so just, we sacked them straight away. And to go from uh, when you've sort of got three people working with you and you suddenly have to tap sack two, um, it's, uh, it's it takes out a big chunk of your workforce. Yeah, yeah. So I had to call, I called my girlfriend uh, who became my wife and said, look, you're going to have to take some time off uni. I need your help down here. And so she came and helped us, and we got some people on board um, very, very quickly, and and built it up. But the the internet business went, just grew so much faster than what we thought. So we went from well, only a few hundred clients, big clients on the telephone, to to a few hundred thousand clients on the internet with by the time we sold in 2013. So it was a it was just amazing. So and and again, one of those things that it just happening in such fast motion, it just it just happens so quickly, you know, and um, uh, and you're sort of holding on by the seat of your pants, just putting out fires every day, and it's a, it's a real buzz and energy when you're growing that fast. Was it a steep learning curve, given it was such a sort of a brand new way of doing business, or are there things that you might have changed looking back that 
if you had a chance again? Yeah, no, 100%. I, we were approached by overseas. Um, we were approached by overseas companies to to use the brand, to use the Waterhouse name and to use Tom Waterhouse name here in Australia and basically be the the front of it and that they'd manage all the internet side of things. And we went, well, gosh, we know bookmaking. Why in the world would we do that? We'll just do it ourselves. But the internet business, that which I didn't realise at the time, is internet bookmaking is really running like any internet business, not really a bookmaking business. And you've seen that with the big corporates in that the actual number of people with skill sets in core trading is not huge. It's mostly people in customer experience, in IT, in data analytics, in digital marketing. They're not core traders, which was the background and skill set. And, and so rather than hiring people that had had experience running online businesses from, um, let's say, in, in the UK or in Europe, we hired, hired talented um, young people that were very smart and the amount of testing that we did and thorough interviewing. And we hired a great team. And you, you can see that by some of the people that um, I was fortunate to work with, with TomWaterhouse.com. I've gone and done some some great things um, since that time and, and but we all were learning on the job you know we, we, and that was having a blueprint of, of success and experience of having done it before counts for a lot um, we were we were basically <laughs> learning everything and, and, that, and that's been stood me in great stead for the future whether it was um, coming on board as CEO of William Hill Australia or now starting out again as TomWaterhouse.com when you have to do learn from scratch, you see how things are actually put together rather than it just being done and a finished product. And, and it was a tremendous learning curve and, and great from a, from that point of view, a great success story, but it was, um, yeah, definitely, I think, uh, getting people with experience rather than thinking, you know, it all, uh, when you, when you're 26 or 27, is probably a, a big lesson, you know? Let's talk price. Unlike bookies and totes, the Betfair Exchange is a low-margin, buy-sell, fixed-odds marketplace where the value stays with the punter, not the house. Ready for the game within the game? Join betfair.com.au. Gamble responsibly. So you mentioned William Hill. They come along in 2013. Take us through that experience and, and I guess the, the period of time with the M&A and then obviously becoming CEO. Yeah, so look, um, the... The, uh, the the environment changed a lot. So we entered the market in 2000 and, 2009. We had some offering, but 2010, we had a full sort of offering. And you'd had Paddy Power um, buy Sportsbet at that time, but they had to go through the migration period and they weren't firing on all cinders like they have been the last couple of years. And, and you, yet to still, you still hadn't had the likes of Bet365 and William Hill and Ladbrokes and... and Dean Shannon um, come come along, and so the, the environment was very different. We could come in and test a, our first marketing budget in 2010 was a hundred thousand dollars. It wasn't stupid at that time to have. A, we probably spent a couple of hundred thousand on IT and only a handful of a handful of people. What happened between 2011 when we fully kicked off and the by 2013 when we sold when these overseas companies came in. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, whether it's in marketing or IT or in people, for these organisations to have 500 plus people to spend 100 million dollars on marketing, to spend 50 million or 100 million on IT. That's that's in the norm rather than, and so the what was needed to to compete and to be able to give a, a customers a great product offering was very different to the time than when we entered. And also you saw that race fields started getting adopted. So the costs associated with running a successful business at scale if, were, were very different. And so we realized by, and what we had is we had a brand that acquired a lot of customers. So we were spending about a fifth of what our competitors were spending on marketing, but we were getting more signups. Our cost per acquisition was really low. And um, so we realized we need to find a partner and, and that partner, looking for a partner that could um, provide the IT and the resources. Well, we looked around the world. We went and spoke to basically everyone we could and and then came to, to a deal with William Hill, um, who just bought the Sporting Bet, Centre Bet um, business a few months before. And I think what we offered for William Hill is we offered a, a very low cost per acquisition brand for them. And they 
and they went for it and, and bought the business in August 2013, which from a financial point of view was, was a great outcome, but at the same time, sort of sort of sad if, uh, in some ways in that you um, you, lo- you lose your name, you know, and, uh, and um, but it was definitely the right decision and a great learning experience again to, to come and see what a big corporate and how they operate. And they do some things amazingly well. And, and you also see that a startup business um, has some unique advantages that, that they don't have. I'm curious about what advice, if any, your father or grandfather gave you at this time. And obviously, they have asked experience. I'm sure you asked them. What, what did they say? Do you remember? Yeah, I think, of it, I think that at every point, they realize the environment changes. And, and if you don't adapt quickly and, and realize where it's going and see where it's going, well, it's exactly the same as whether you're moving from Sydney to Melbourne because the tax environment changes or moving from being in the middle of the rails in Melbourne to going to telephone. It looks, you're like, why in the world would, if you're in the middle of the rails holding more than anyone, well, why would you not go to the races? It's sort of, now it doesn't sound bizarre, but in 2009 it does. And and then, well, you've got a large telephone, why bother with the inter- internet? So every, every point, businesses change and if you're not changing quickly and adapting quickly well you you're going to go out of out of business and and for us the um the taxes were going up the costs of internet running an internet business were going up the marketing costs were hugely going through the through the roof and and you had all these overseas companies coming in and wanting to buy up whatever they could so it's I think it just made made complete sense. And we also, we had a low-cost acquisition brand, but we also realised very quickly that buying up all the Australian media assets were going to be worth worth a lot because there's only a certain amount of media assets here, whether it's AFL, rugby league, racing. And whatever we did, we just tried to buy up as much as of those media assets as, as we possibly could because we knew that if you've got overseas companies like Bet365, William Hill, Ladbrokes coming in, they'll need to find a way to advertise and they'll need those um, those media assets. If they want to get eyeballs in, in Australia watching, they only really watch um, two or three main things. So we we basically went in very hard to try and find or try and get as many of those assets as we could. So I want to touch on one more element from that period from, I guess, 2008 to maybe 2015 and you're probably one of the best people in the world to ask about it. What value was placed on trading or good trading throughout that period and and how did it evolve? Well, I think when you're looking at um, the IAS Mark Reid period, like there was a huge value put on trading. I I didn't have a work to obviously with Mark Reid, but I always looked at their prices in the beginning in the morning. It was a great guide where the money was going and you had these, in 2008, still in 2008, you had people where, you could get on to win a hundred or a couple of hundred thousand. It was it was it was um, a very different environment, and you'd betting was a very different thing. Where well, as soon as the advertising changed and the overseas corporates came in, their business model was very different to um, traditional Australian bookmakers. You sort of used the professional punters back at that time to give you a real guide on where the market was going, and the recreational non-price sensitive customers were all with the the tab at that point but then as soon as advertising came about those recreational customers shifted to corporate bookmakers or on a much larger scale and the business really became well how do we make sure that we retain these recreational customers that want to have a bet more of entertainment much lower bet size and actually if we just look after these customers do a really good job of retaining them and giving them a great service and we don't manage these professional punters, well, we'll be able to get higher margins, we'll be able to give them a much better product offering. And there was just this massive shift towards that was the sole focus. And um, I think that that is very, very sad in, in some ways, but I, I can also see why it's a natural decision if you're a business owner or shareholder of those corporates to do it. But I think also not, not great from racing's point of view because the thing about racing is that you can be a winning punter. If you dedicate your time and your effort and you do the form on sit down on a Thursday and Friday and Saturday morning and get up early and, and really pay attention to the form, you can find where the market gets it wrong. And there was a huge incentive when you could get on to do that. And 
that skill and, and that time and effort, the, the reward is not there in the same way as it was before, which I think I think racing is, is probably what is, is worse off. And, and you've seen the shift from turnover from racing to sport. And I'm not saying it's because of that sole reason, but I, I um, yeah, but it, there, there's things that are sad in every bit. You go back and you go, oh, well, wasn't it sad that they used to get 40,000 every Saturday to the race? You know, there's bits, things just change and you can look back and go, well, that's uh, how upsetting is that? But it's just part and parcel. Things change, and, and you've got to look. Um, uh, I know one of the big professional punters said to me, and I said, "Oh, how bad is this? We can't get on, and this is so hard now, and the, the environment's changed. They're only betting us to win two thousand, and all this." And he said, "No, nah, this is the best that it's ever been." And I said, "What are you talking about?" And he said, "Oh, well, it only takes two or three thousand to make the market shift." It's just so easy to get the market shifted exactly the way you want it. And that's, I went, gosh, well, isn't that bloke a smart guy? Because he's thinking, well, actually, why is it better now? What's, how's it working better for me? And, and, and that happens all the time. Um, so you can always sit there and go, oh, isn't it a nightmare? But as long as you're looking, well, okay, it's changed. How do I make it better for me? There, there's always opportunities. And there's heaps of opportunities now. Look at the fact that every corporate bookmaker has to bet you a minimum bet after 9 a.m. on a Saturday. Well, if you spend the time to get automated and do, do all of these things, well, there's a big opportunity to to still get on, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do you think it's pushed a lot of the great traders and and form experts to become punters? And do you think there's an a there's an area for those types of people to to play within the game as as full time professional punters? I think there is, but it's, I think the you've seen the the guys and the teams that have got the really great. And put the resource uh, and the effort into automation, and uh, they're using like um, algorithms and mathematics to really look in the market and improve their model. They seem to be winning at a higher and higher margin. And the guys that were spending the time in a uh, watching the videos and have, keeping their own database and doing it more as a sole trader type business has become. It seems to me from where I, where I, I see it is that um, it's been tougher for them, but there's always going to be areas when things get completely automated, there's going to be little wrinkles for people that do it themselves to find, and I'm sure people are doing it. So I'm I'm curious and, and interested in your battles with some of these Goliath punters and obviously having huge turnover and, you know, huge bets, punters betting, you know, millions of dollars over carnivals. What's it like between sort of Tom Waterhouse and these multi-million dollar punters? Can you take us through sort of a day or a, or a week um, and some of the things you think about or, or they might think about? Yeah, so look, at the um, it was... It, my dad and my grandfather always say that a, a bet's a, a good one if you can, at the point that you take the bet and then after you take the bet, you can get off for exactly what you've you've taken. So if, if you take 100000 on it, at three dollars, if you can bet it back at one hundred thousand three dollars after you've taken that bet, well, it's probably a pretty good bet. If suddenly you're taking a bet that no one else in the world wants to take and you can't lay it off at all, then it's probably not the best. And back in two thousand eight, or up till two thousand eight, when we were betting very big, is that you had a very liquid market. So there were at least three bookies in Sydney that were would bet us to win a hundred thousand dollars in bet backs each, and so. For, for us to uh, we had access to Betfair, obviously Rob spends unlimited time doing doing the form and had some large customers and had a liquid market where if you didn't want the bet you could trade it was it was a um, it was a market where you were very happy to take a winning customer to win twenty thousand or fifty thousand or, or, or more now when the market changed within a year, and suddenly, well, you can't get off with that amount. You become far more selective in the bets that you want to take and and who you let on. And um, and that changed. That changed pretty quickly. But in terms of, yeah, you have just as much fun as a, on a Thursday at Wyong sometimes as you would on a, a major Saturday at Randwick or Flemington. Betting uh, and who you got betting at the time and what happens at the track every day is really fun. And, and I, I can't say look this was oh, the funnest day or this was the it was it was all good so a couple of general questions for you tom before we let you go 
What do you see as some of the biggest challenges for the industry, you know, the bookmaking industry, especially in, in 2018 and beyond? Look, I think with the increase in, um, in tax, so you were seeing with the Northern Territory, they're paying 0.3% on turnover tax up until race fields came on. And now with point of consumption, they're paying probably like probably close to 40% of their gross profits uh, in tax. It really plays into the hands of those with scale. So the the, the bigger will get bigger um, and the smaller ones will probably have to consolidate or, or run a very lean um, business model. The, the very small bookmakers, they can still make a good living and obviously you see the on track that bookmakers can still pay a lower tax and can still offer credit. But I don't think you're going to see like you did where it was William Hill, Ladbrokes, Bet365, Sportsbet, TAB, Sports, like you, the TAB, Unibet, UBet, all of these with very aggressive offers and different sign-up offers and different um, bonus bets and all this sort of stuff. I think you're going to see two, maybe three really big competitors over the period of time. Um, while it's it's this tax environment, then the, things may change. You know, it's, it's, the taxes were a lot higher and they became lower in the 60s and 70s and then they rose again and then Northern Territory came about. It, it all changes all the time. But I think we're going in a period now of, and you're seeing this with consolidation, obviously. William Hill's just been sold to, to Crown Bet and, uh, and the Stars Group, uh, Overseas Group, and, and I'm sure they're going to do a great job um, out here with the two businesses together. Matt Tripp's a, obviously a terrific operator. So I think they'll do a great job, and I think Sportsbet's proven that they're, um, they're real market leaders uh, here in the market. And then obviously Tabs, the Tab Tats coming together there, they've um, been huge players, and they've got that retail base, that land-based uh, operation that they're going to be hard to beat. And and look, that's not to say they're the three winners. I, I just they um, they definitely look like they're they're in the pole position though at the moment. So what's on the agenda now? I'm guessing you have a non-compete in place, and have you thought about what you'll do in the interim period before that elapses? Oh, yeah. So look, for work, working with William Hill and being CEO of the, of the Australian business out here was just a an unbelievable privilege and such a great experience, and, and working with a big company. And they they gave my um my when they sold the business, they gave the brands back to me. Obviously, the, the TomWaterhouse.com brand back, and and which was I'm so thankful um, for that because obviously you sell a business, but it's it's hard when you sell your name. And, and so to get that that back, um, I've obviously launched a, a tipping site um, to begin with and, and going to roll out a, a whole variety of businesses using the, um, the TomWaterhouse.com name over the over the coming months and, and, and years. And, and then also look what the opportunities are outside Australia. So obviously you've seen, um, you've seen America, um, where it's now there would be ability of the states to to decide whether they have sports betting or not. Each state would be like a um, a mini Australia, and, and I think that's a huge opportunity for all of us in in the industry. And and then you're seeing the growth in in Asia. It's it's just amazing to see the growth of um, cryptocurrency operators um, in, in Asia. It's I, I just can't believe um, the amount of money that they're turning over. And and you're also seeing the, um, the, the, the growth of social gaming and, and gin rummy games in, um, in, in India. Well, when I talked about Asia, I meant more um, Southeast Asia and China. But in India, also, you're seeing the growth of um, these social ga- this social gaming. And I, I think there's some really exciting sp- stuff happening in the gaming gambling space um, at the moment. And, I, and yeah, I'm just, I'm so happy to be to be back in business and look, um, yeah, I, I loved being in corporate life and learned a lot from it, but uh, I definitely have a, an extra bounce in my step, step now um, being being back in business uh, on my own. Tom, I really do appreciate your time. I wish you all the very best with uh, with your future, whatever it holds, hopefully global domination. But, but yeah, thanks a lot for uh, coming on and having a chat. Terrific. Thanks so much, Jake. Thank you.